today, we're speaking with Shai Chalakuti. She is the head of enterprise data analytics and digital technology at HPE. HPE is an enormous company, and today we're going to talk about the life cycle of data, the role that data plays in digital transformation and organizational transformation more broadly. Hey, Shai, how are you today? Wonderful, Michael. How about you? How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Shai, before we even start, how was the past quarter, your most recent quarter? Oh, Michael, we had a fantastic quarter and a remarkable 2021. Um, our, we exceeded expectations across all of our metrics. Um, our order growth went up 9% sequentially and 28% from prior period. Our net revenue, 7.4 billion, up 7% sequentially. And if you talk about our as a service ARR, 796 million, up 36% year on year. Um, Honestly, it has been one of the fantastic year coming out of COVID and coming out of this major change that we are all kind of adjusting ourselves to. I'm very proud about what HP has done in 2021. Um, so if you look at the trend that's happening today in the industry uh, post the COVID pandemic, um, I would probably classify into three important trends. The first one is at the edge. The data is exploding at the edge today, We're looking at several zettabytes of data being generated and the enterprise are mandated to manage this data effectively. They have to be able to wrangle the data and manage it. The second important trend is the infrastructure itself. Uh, the, the, the demand of customer experience puts on pressure on these companies to be able to manage their infrastructure seamlessly from legacy to the cloud which is one of the biggest aspects of the trend that is happening today. And the last but not the least, which is favorite to me being a data professional, is there is an ongoing demand and need to extract value from the data. And when I look at what HPE does, is basically addressing we are at the center, at the nexus of all of these trends, providing solutions to our business partners and to our enterprise, so honestly, I feel like very proud to be part of the company and very excited about the prospects we have in 2022 and beyond. Shai, congratulations on these great results. Now, you are head of enterprise data analytics and digital technology. Mm -hmm. What does that role mean and what does that role encompass? Very, I'm, it kind of really, and one day feel very, very happy to be part of that uh, enterprise role doing it. It's basically, think, of, think about it, Michael, is internalizing the business model I just explained to you, is ensuring that I can drive a data first modernization for the company. We want to ensure Antonio's biggest charter is for me is to enable data leading our digital transformation. And that is what me and my team does as part of my role. The biggest vision for me is to create a unified data source, not necessarily a physical data source, but a virtualized unified data source that is accessible for each and every one of my stakeholders, my internal customers and external customers, being able to get from a single source of truth. Um, well, the vision is easier said than done. Um, if you think about what Gartner is telling us is the company spent 80% of their time doing data wrangling. And honestly, we are no different. Um, the amount of time it takes to ensure that your data is managed effectively, you get the metadata effectively from your data, your data lineage, your data profiling, your data quality. Um, I can go on and on about the governance that requires to manage the data. And that is primarily the mission of my organization. My team members live and breathe to ensure that we create a sophisticated, automated, simplified view of a data that can be consumed across by both our internal and external customers. And that kind of is pivot for our digital transformation because data is one is going to be driving that insights to help the business drive their digital transformation. Shai, you said something very important that using data to support digital transformation is an initiative that is driven by your CEO. Absolutely, Michael. If you look at our business model, 
um, Antonio has been very clear about us pivoting into as a service subscription model. Uh, and today, probably we are all very used to it. If you look at your probably your phone usage or in, even your electrical usage at your home, you pay for what you use. And that is becoming the demand from the customer. So that is one of our biggest transformation that Antonio is driving. But what's the beauty of that is um, we are not just changing our billing pattern from your monthly subscription or yearly subscription to a usage base. But when we're doing that, we want to ensure we provide our customers solution for their problems, not just products or services as we have been doing all along. So that is one of the biggest pivot and change we are doing to our business model. And data is at the front and center because you got to know your customer. You got to know what the solution that they're looking for in order to provide a customized personalized service. And therefore our entire new business model is driven uh, from data first mindset or data leading the digital transformation, which is what makes it even more exciting with all of the uh, importance of data that drives the transformation. So data is at the heart of digital transformation, which is really foundational right now for HPE. Can you give us some examples of use cases in which you're using data very intensively to support these goals you were just describing? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I can probably give a more generic use case that all of us can relate to. Of course, being in a technology industry, uh, we do have a specific use case we can talk about if time permits, but the most generic one that all of us can relate to is knowing your customer. Um, more commonly, probably the industry calls it as customer 360, is basically understanding your full spectrum of your customer. And if you look at that from HPE perspective, like I said, uh, we provide solutions for your server needs, uh, for storage needs for the enterprise, uh, for networking, uh, for software, for consulting, on and on. So being able to understand the customer from each of these different metrics, each of these personas and profiles, and also understanding their entire journey, I want to be able to understand my customer, every interaction from them, the minute they start probably with a website inquiry or a sales calls they make or a support call they have with my support staff, kind of encapsulating all of that information into one single pane provides immense value to all of our businesses, including our business functions um, like service team members or our marketing team members, our sales team members. I think that has been one of the important initiative we are maniacally focusing on so that uh, it kind of goes with our brand value as well, Michael. If you think about HPE, our brand is customer service, customer engagement, treating customer rights. So I think it comes naturally to us, but that is one of the biggest initiative that is data driven that we are focusing on to enable a digital transformation. So when you talk about customer engagement and using data to better understand and to better service the customer, what kinds of data are you referring to? Um, interesting. Um, every sort of data uh, is kind of the generic answer. But if you kind of kind of peel down the end, it is about looking at the master and the transaction data. We follow the customer through their entire life journey. To be honest, even before they could become a potential customer for us. So the data kind of starts from a pre-sales perspective all the way to the sales and then post-sales. Like I said. Our brand focuses on the customer post the sales as well. We, we build long lasting relationships with our customers. So the data kind of flows through um, from end to end perspective, Michael. And most of them, it's a mixture of data. It could be um, more structured data when it comes to a sales, but when it comes to pre-sales, we look at um, the industry trends that's happening. We pick on social data. What is the current need of this customer? What are they talking about? in terms of their biggest problem. We identify that through the social data, which is mostly unstructured data that we also have to cater to. Then we also look at uh, customer sentiment and customer analysis that comes through these uh, different listening channels that we have, which are potentially unstructured data. And then when you come to the sales part, I think it is simply think about it as uh, from the time court to cash, the ability for us to be able to generate transactions. And this is where the heart of our data is. 
a highly secured and highly regulated uh, set of data that we manage here to enable the customer journey through the sales process. Um, and then when it comes to post-sales, I think you, you kind of look at a mixture of data again here, because when it comes to the service channels, it's mostly voice data. So we are looking at converting voice to structured data. Or when you look at images, because we trace our images of our products that we are implementing in our customer location. So that is more, again, unstructured data, where we look at converting images to structured data. So the data is kind of mixed bag, but predominantly focusing on transactional data that can help us serve our customer better. And that transactional data covers the entire customer journey, basically all of the interactions that that customer may have with HP, I would assume. Absolutely, absolutely. And we also, I, because being a, a technology company and because we do have the luxury of using our own product, uh, we are very, very um, open to collecting as much as data as possible. I strongly believe as a data leader, right, you got to pick your data. And of course, then you cleanse it and you pick the right information you need to service your customer, but you never cut short on your ability to collect as much data as possible. To be honest, I'll be a little bit greedy over there. We pick every data as possible and then use what we need to use, but that we never go shortage on collecting all the data that we need from a customer perspective. You know, one important question is how do you link that body of data that you're collecting to the business decisions that support the customer through the life cycle? That seems to be the missing link that a lot of organizations have trouble with. Absolutely. Again, uh, if I go and code it right, uh, there is a myth that you can use um, AI ML or you can create this personalization or you can respond to a better experience of the customer, but you're spot on, Michael. If you are not able to clearly articulate and tie the dependency, that is where your data governance comes into perspective. That is what my team is maniacally focusing on. We do have data stewards within our business partners who we kind of call upon to help us connect the business language of the data. But I think where automation of tools and processes help us to bring the data profiling, the data lineage, and connecting the key aspects of the data all through the journey is where most of our time is being spent. And that comes with both, I would say, tools and process. Both of them have to work hand in hand. And usually I kind of uh, tease my team saying it's a little bit of characteristic. You got to have governance policies. You got to have the strict policies of how you use this data and how are you connecting the data? And there is no exception to it. And I'm uh, I'm very big stricter of that. Uh, and I don't hesitate to use my stick where it need be. But then you also give, have to give carrot uh, in terms of your customer um, usage. So we do have a lot of federated data sources where we allow the business to go and experience the data themselves, go and discover uh, new elements of the data, which keeps them engaged and keeps them reinforcing why it's important for them to invest upfront in defining the data governance policy. So it's kind of an yin and the yang that works together for us. Shai, you've been discussing the, shall we say, the, the business data, the transactional data to help you understand your customers better and serve them better. What about telemetry data that comes from the software <laughs> and the technologies that you've deployed with your customers? Oh gosh, you hit the heart of what we do here, uh, Michael. Um, yes, customer obsessed we are and customer data is important for us, but oh boy, the telemetry data is a lot of fun for us. Um, if you really think about telemetry, right, it comes from a Greek word, uh, tele and metron, very simple. Tele means remote and metron means measure. And this is not a new um, science or a new field. Telemetry has been there for a long time and machines have been uh, used to generate data. But I think what is important now in this day and age is the amount of data that these machines create. Um, machines are getting more and more sophisticated, especially our machines as we deploy uh, into our client spaces are highly smart machines. And not only they generate data and give us indications and clues of how they behave, but they also can self heal themselves. They can also understand and have AI ML embedded in them to speculate what is going to happen and predict and react to it. So it's important for us to understand 
how these machines behave and we collect tons and tons of telemetry data and i can tell you uh, anyone if you talk about telemetry the first biggest challenge they're going to tell you is about storage uh, because uh, machines oh boy they generate more data than we do um, and continually being getting information from them so to be honest we spend quite a bit of time my team in being able to manage that effectively uh, slice the data how do we get the trend from the data how do we ensure that we do not have the burden of storage of this data exclusively but continually work with the data to understand and improvise on what we can build um it is definitely a big focus for us and a fun place and we are learning oh boy as we are more and more discovering the usage of telemetry well in a minute i do want to talk about the infrastructure you have for managing collecting and managing all this data but first can you give us a couple of examples of the kinds of data that comprise the telemetry that you're discussing absolutely so maybe i can give an example and that might kind of connect much better as well so if you think about our network devices um think of it as a modem that is available in your household hopefully it's an aruba modem that we have supplied um for us but if you think about this modem what we do is this modem continually generates data for us and we monitor this data through our servers and it tells us the behavior so let us say an, an organization has deploying about 70 80 or 800 of these modems across their entire office space what we can really do with this data is understand the behavioral patterns of that ecosystem uh, the recent example i have is where we had an organization that supplied about 800 of these um of these modems and we found out that about 30% of these devices are rarely being used because those are in remote areas where people never go and access the data so what we did was define an optimization plan for this organization to reuse or place these modems in the right configuration to maximize their investment with us and that was a win win because not only were we able to provide a better solution for our customer but the customer were also able to save um, overall optimization efficiency with their infrastructure so that is kind of the big advantage we have with telemetry and when we talk about ai ml and all of that that helps us understanding the self healing pattern of a device understanding how it controls the temperature uh, around its ecosystem that kind of data we internally use to understand our product catalog how do we improvise our product de- depending on if a device for example fails four times from a customer perspective it self healed itself and there is no disruption but for us it means a lot so it means we do a recall of that product so that we can now fix it and prevent those kind of failures so i would probably look at it in both ways we first focus on serving and optimizing for external customers using telemetry data but more importantly we learn from these devices the capability of our products and we continually improve that in order to make better products for our customers It's so interesting. So you're you're collecting this large volume of telemetry data. You're running that data through your machine learning models that then gives you action items we could say whether it's to feed that feed information back to product design or deploy those products at this particular customer in some different way. but it all ends up being very actionable because of that data source namely the telemetry absolutely i i think getting deep insights and actionable insights from our data is what kind of makes it rubber hit the road to your point michael that's where i think the um don't get me wrong not all of the data has been successful we did have quite a bit of fast fail approaches but what excites us is the possibility that we can do with this actions that we can get um more importantly benefiting our customers i think that is what kind of puts us back on focus to collect this data and serve our customer better you mentioned that this data also gets fed back upstream into product design product development can you tell us a little more about that um absolutely i think as we learn about this data we do have r and d teams within every every product life cycle we do have r and d teams where we we kind of collect this data and the data is being given to this business leads and then they 
investigate the data and identify actionable insights from it, gets prioritized into the investment life cycle and they use it accordingly as they see a requirement uh, based on the requirements that the data tells them. So it is a continuous cycle of understanding the data, trying to make some meaningful sense out of it. My data scientists help them understand and connect the feature sets to it and then try to make an actionable insight coming out of it, going back to the product life cycle for future product features. It sounds like as time goes on, this telemetry data is becoming an increasingly more important source of information for you to refine the products and the services that you're selling. Absolutely, absolutely, because data speaks to us. Um, and the more we try to interpret and understand the language of data, I think the better off we're going to be. And like I said, that is something um, I don't want to say that we are completely literate uh, yet. We are still learning and we are evolving. But I think that's a, that's where the fun starts for us is being able to understand and interpret and make some sense from the data. Now, let's talk about the infrastructure that you mentioned briefly a few minutes ago. First, are you working with real-time data or is it non-real-time data? What kind of data do you work with for the most part? Um, it's really a mixed bag. And I would say, Michael, it's more use case driven. Um, from an architecture perspective, an infrastructure perspective, I can tell you that we are quite sophisticated and we can handle both real time and non-real time data. When I mean it's use case driven, let me tell you an example. Uh, for example, a customer comes and plays an order with us and then they want to immediately understand where is their order? What, what, where is the life cycle of the order is happening? What does a shipment uh, date look like? They want to make an immediate change to the order. Those have to be handled real time. Uh, so that is all. We treat them with real time data. We bring it to our infrastructure. We kind of follow the data from source to the target. And as it goes from the source, we'll just think of it as a pipeline going and we're going to be able to plug and play and get the data at the right time, the way we need it for our operational purposes. But then, as you talked about uh, telemetry data or customer uh, data, we then collect this data into our data lake and then do create a lot of uh, aggregations on this data, bring several source of data together, bring the social data, bring the telemetry data, bring the customer data, and aggregate the data, data and create a consumption layer. That is usually done non-real time because you need time. You need to understand the data. You need to be able to interpret the meaning of the data and that requires a lot of computational power and a lot of um, processing that needs to happen on the data. So that usually happens in the back end as a non-real time data where we can go and do AI ML on it. But most of our customer experiences and customer needs are done through real time data. So your infrastructure is flexible enough to handle all of these different kinds of data sources, bring them together so that you can do whatever kind of analysis is, is appropriate. Michael, I wouldn't say that we have a fully fledged architecture that supports all business case. I, I don't believe that as a technologist and as a data architect, you can have an architecture that's going to support end all business case. As we are advising to our end customer, one of the key principles I ask my team to adopt is to ensure that we optimize our infrastructure. But I can assure you this though, we do have a fast data architecture and well-defined data principles that we embed and we live by that as a business use case comes to us, we look at the use case, understand the data needs of it, understand the consumption need of it, and ensure that we can embed that to our existing architecture more in a plug and play fashion. So you begin with the business use case and then you optimize the path from beginning to end based on that specific use case. Absolutely. I think every business use case, we have a very strict principle of understanding the value proposition that it's going to bring. Uh, because as I said, as much as we talk about storage is very cheap, especially me being in HPE, we use all, most of our infrastructure is HOH, what we call as HP on HPE, but nonetheless, I think by principle, what we are ensuring is that we optimize, optimize, optimize. And one of the big advantage I have, or we can call it as responsibility as well, I have is being a zero customer of our product. Um, 
call it as bringing my own champagne. Um, so I often go talk to the clients about my existing data architecture and how I've optimized it and how I'm reusing various components of it to show as a real use case example for them to implement in their, uh, in their infrastructure. So it's very, very important for us to ensure that anything that we build within HPE for our internal use is something that we could confidently recommend to our end user as well. So it's quite optimized and quite principle driven, depending on the use case that we're supporting. So when it comes to data, your customer is zero, meaning you are, you're the test. I am the test. I don't want to say uh, eat your own dog food. I would rather say drink your own champagne. Um, no, I, I, that, that's kind of how I look at it. Um, I am kind of my first defense for my product teams. Uh, we use most of the infrastructure that we have within our existing uh, data structure is on Esmeral or on GreenLake, the product that we maniacally support or encourage our customers to use. And I am the first test bed, a live test bed for my product team. So uh, we gel very well. Um, and um, it, it's been a quite interesting experience with that. Uh, we, as we use it, we are able to relate to our customers. We are able to see from the customer lens as well as we are able to identify uh, real problems before we go to our customers. So it's kind of like a big win for us being our first customer for our products. How much data are you working with? How fast do you need that data? Can you give us a sense to understand the, the context of the data itself? Absolutely. Um, we talked about telemetry data a lot. I um, mean, when you talk about telemetry, you're looking at zettabytes of data. So I'm, I'm being very careful about that. So there, I think my approach is going to be, like I said, is collect the data over a period of time, analyze it offline, and then identify a trend. Um, if you look at the use cases that you're looking at, that kind of dealing with zettabyte of data, you're not looking at real-time, fast-time um, response nature. It's more about analytics, understanding, and creating solutions based on what the data tells you. But when you look at the code to cash that we talked about, which is your bread and butter, of HPE, your ERP systems. There you're talking about probably petabytes of data. So you're still talking about large volume of data, but not enormous, huge, humongous volume as telemetry data. So there I think our approach is more about contained architecture, managing within our own on-prem infrastructure, managing storage to the needs that we have and being making effective use of the data for real time needs is what I would probably look at. And what kind of infrastructure are you using to collect, to manage, to analyze all of this data? It's a lot of data. Um, coming from an infrastructure perspective, I'm very fortunate uh, working for HPE because, I, like I said, I'm the zero customer. Uh, most of my infrastructure are HOH, HPE on HPE. But of course, we also rely on third-party products and third-party open sources that we extensively use uh, within our uh, premise. Again. My aim is to create a infrastructure guideline or infrastructure blueprint that matches my end customer. So if that is being the premise of my approach, obviously I would have third party embedded within. Me. If you think about any common data lake, you're looking at a probably a Hadoop infrastructure that can process a multiple map or map reduce jobs, a Spark, Spark streaming, Kafka streaming, you call it with, within our enterprise we have that infrastructure. Um, Delta Lake, which is very important for our customers and for me as well, which helps us combine the traditional RTDMS with the latest and greatest flexible schema architecture is very much part of my infrastructure. And then if you look at um, microservices and fast API, one of the biggest thing that we are pushing is to ensure that we can decouple all of these into Lego blocks. The more we decouple, the more better off we are because we can effectively manage plug and play architecture better and more efficiently. So fast API and microservices architecture is very much embedded part of my infrastructure as well. And how much of this infrastructure is cloud-based versus on-premises? Um, to me, I would say, again, we have the luxury of a private cloud. Um, so most of it is cloud-based from that sense of being in a private cloud. Uh, but we do have quite a bit of legacy infrastructure. So we are no stranger to having legacy infrastructure and technical debt like most of our customers have. 
So most of our data is on-prem as well. So I use my Esmeral product that we are very much um, would combine this all of this data seamlessly for me into one data fabric that will allow me to switch from on-prem to cloud seamlessly is one of the biggest advantage I have that I use effectively within my infrastructure. How do you make the decision about whether to place data on premises or in the cloud? Um, to be honest, I think off late, the question is more about the volume of data because the default is cloud-based, right? Again, it's a private cloud for us. That's how we start. Uh, most of our default starts with the guiding principle. But like you talked about earlier, it also depends on the volume of data. Um, it's important that your data stays very close to your business processes. Um, where you have a real-time need of data, where you want to respond to your customers very quickly, where you're looking at um, ability to manage it effectively and react to it, then that kind of data usually stays on-prem for us because that is where you can act quickly and you can make the um, decisions that you need to make. But things like telemetry data that we talked about or Salesforce data that we talk about usually resides on the cloud because in this case, you do have the luxury of time versus storage. You look at the storage first, then it becomes on-prem. If it is more time first, then you have the luxury. You can wait and work through it to a, to a private cloud situation. So you're making explicit decisions about what makes sense based on the particular use case, really? Absolutely. I think it kind of goes back to what I said before. Um, most of our infrastructure and most of our decisions around architecture is driven by use cases. Of course, we do have an architecture framework that will be applicable to most of the use case, but you're spot on, Michael. I think it's important that we look at the use case and design to it because each of them is unique and they have a unique need that we need to serve. Shai, earlier you used the term data culture. Tell us about the data culture at HPE and what are you trying to do with data culture? The more and more the industry is moving towards the technology trends, data is becoming a common language. I think we all have to become data literates uh, in order to survive today in any industry that you are in. So one of the biggest aspects for us is focusing on and embedding that culture within HPE today. Um, the good news for me, again, is that our business strategy, as we discussed earlier, is built around helping enterprises manage data effectively. So translating that business language into an internal data language is a little bit easier uh, for me um, and embedding that part of our culture. So we have established a data operating model. We are calling it as data operating model 2.0 um, in the spirit of supporting Antonio's as a transformation business strategy. And that enables us instill the data literacy and the data focus we need across all of our business partners. And what is the composition of your team? How do you enable this kind of data literacy inside the organization? Um, again, great question. Um, one way I look at it, I probably advise most of the data leaders to look at is, I think when I look at the team, when you talk about it, Michael, I, I look at it as an extended organization because every consumer of data has to be data literate uh, in order for you to be successful. So what we have done is part of our data operating model, one big change that we have emphasized is every business organization has a data leader. And the data leader is a very senior leader in the organization. And if you have to quote our um, chief operating officer, uh, we basically see, say that the data leader has to have two questions that they need to look at. One is, what data do I need to run my business? That's kind of the primary goal. They look into the, all of that business process and say, what data do I need to run my business and do I have the right data? But most importantly, I think, the role that we've asked them to do is, what data am I missing that I don't have that I need in order to be pushing my business further? So I think that role is very, very significant um, that has been coming from top-down support that enables us bring that data literacy to each of the business units. Um, we also have data stewards and data custodians across the enterprise. Our stewards are typically in the business um, unit and their job is to be the guardian of the data. They own the data. They have to ensure that the policies and principles around the data are established clearly and the custodians 
are part of my organization. And what their job is to do is part of the stewards to automate as much as possible around data. So the combination of a technical custodian working with a business owner who's a steward who owns and manages the data, I think that combination helps us to manage the data wrangling uh, that we that very much we spend quite a bit of time on. Then if you look at my team perspective, I think we are a very small team because I consider the entire Pan HP to be my extended organization. And typically my team is focused on data analysts and data engineers and machine learning engineers who focus on automating and creating those pipelines for the end users uh, to take the value out of the data. Shai, you've described a data transformation, digital transformation, organizational transformation, and you've said several times that this is being driven by your CEO. So can you describe the impact of data across the organization at HPE? Absolutely. Um, if you think about our as a service business model, where, where I emphasize that we are not just looking to shift our billing pattern to become more a usage-based billing, but providing a customized solutions for our business partners. So one of the big use cases that we have is to understand our customer need. Uh, let me probably give you an example. When we are looking at telemetry data across our multiple customers and being able to connect the data with their existing um, subscription that they have with us and being able to provide a personalized solution for them for their future needs. So when you sit down and talk to our customer, we do not just look at the past history of data, but we also look at what their future business needs are. And we get that future trend from the industry data, from the social data that we have, and we're able to create a pattern for them. So data kind of helps us not only understanding our customer from their lens, but also getting the social and the surrounding data to give them a projection of what we think they need. And in most cases, Michael, we have found that the customer may not even have thought about it about their needs, what they have, but us bringing that to the table with them based on experience has made a big difference um, to the bottom line for our business perspective. Um, the other example I can give you, like I said, is being a zero customer. As we are experiencing all of these changes, we are trying to balance between a personalization and standardization. Of course, anyone in the industry would know the more you personalize, yes, you are trying to get the more closer to your customer, but then you're adding a lot of overhead uh, to your operations. It's, it's important you find a balance uh, between these two. So these kind of being the zero customer, being able to understand from an end user perspective, we try to integrate as much as the customer needs into standardization. Um, I think it's a little bit public information. Most recently, one of the recommendations we made was to integrate Presto into Esmora, for example. So as we understand the customer need being a zero customer, we are also able to provide insights to our product of what is the best product roadmap they should adopt in order to get more closer to standardization um, as we personalize for customer needs. Shai, given everything you've been describing, I have to ask, what advice do you have for business leaders who want to follow the example you've described of embedding data into the DNA, the fabric of the organization? A great question. Great question, Michael. I've been a data leader for almost 15 years of my career. And I can tell you, uh, the common myth is that um, is around AIML. Uh, most of us think um, AI ML is a new buzzword in the industry. It was big data about eight, 10 years ago. And we think that machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to solve all of our problems. Uh, trust me, I am a doctoral student and thesis of AI ML. I value it very much. But I think it's important to understand that it is garbage in is garbage out. So you need to focus on your foundation. You need to ensure that you spend time um, and it's not the fun part of the job, to be honest, it's a hard job, but ensuring that you're able to manage your data effectively. I think that is where I would ask that we start your focus on. On the foundation, ensure that you have it very strong, you have a good data governance policy, you're able to institute a very standard data operating model that you can, repeatable systems and processes that you have. The next one I would probably look at is a balanced approach. What I call as a yin and the yang or 
uh, in officially in my strategy, you would see it as a defense, an active strategy. Um, the defense is more about, like I said, ensuring that you're abiding by the governance policies, ensuring that you focus on security. The last thing you want is a headline. And we've seen this over and over and again with data, uh, with, with the cyber threats that's happening around is the headlines about a security breach within your data. And as and when you create more and more, you're trying to create that common data fabric, you have to think about it. You are creating the crown jewel for the company. So the last thing you want is to hand off the keys to someone that you don't want to have the keys for. So focusing on the defense, focusing on security, focusing on data policies, being the tough partner that you have to be um, is very important for any data leader, um, especially when they're playing an enterprise role, um, is to have that uh, standard policies is important. Then on the active strategy wise, what I have usually done is um, follow the N equal to one strategy, as I call it, meaning start small, start with a use case, understand the business value the use case can drive and start implementing that use case and show the business value to your customers. I think the more you start showing the value, you can then easily augment your solutions rather than building a big ocean or solving for the entire end-to-end -end strategy. I've always found that being able to defense and, and introduce an active strategy has been one that has been helping me successful in all of my previous roles and it's no change over here, I would, I would do it. The last one I can I would say to my peers is, uh, don't try to do it alone. Uh, this is an ocean continually evolving. Data technology has the most changes it has seen in the last 10 years and more changes yet to come. Um, seek help, I uh, look for, um, if I can plug in here, Michael, I would say HPE is a company that thrives on helping uh, with data solutions to the enterprise. So look for help with external customers, external products, and um, enable a successful end-to-end -end strategy. Very practical advice, important advice. Shai, where is all of this going? What is the future of data? <laughs> um, I think data is going to be everywhere. Um, if you think about what has happened over a 10 decade time, right? Um, if I'm right, I think we had about two zettabytes of data created globally in 2010. Today, if you can imagine, Michael, in 2020, uh, 10 years later, we are about creating 41 zettabytes of data. I mean, look at the volume of growth and we have just started our journey. Um, the more and more we're introducing machines into our day-to-day -day operations, the more and more Bluetooth we are having, more and more we're getting to the edge computing. Um, this volume of data is only going to increase. Um, and like I said earlier, with automation becoming a norm for us, it's not even a luxury anymore. Robotics is becoming part of our everyday life. Um, data operations and data ops and looking at uh, more automation is becoming um, a big thing that we need to continue to focus on. Um, 5G is becoming a new wireless standard. Um, enterprise will leverage edge analytics and start making real-time decisioning. I mean, it's not long enough for us to be able to do a space travel and come back in a matter of time. So I think if you look at from a data perspective, it is going to be the biggest asset a company has to focus on. I know we've been hearing about this um, in the industry right now, but I truly believe that data is going to become an asset and become part of the balance sheet of all of the companies. Um, and I think the digital natives will take a lead on it for us to show us how it has to be done. And data is going to become a universal language. Um, I know we talk about um, becoming a flat universe. I think data is going to be the one that's going to let us communicate with each other and the machines together in one common language. So it's important that we all get literate uh, around data. Data as part of the balance sheet. I love that. I've not heard that before. Shai Chalakuti, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Well, thank you, Michael, for having me. I equally enjoyed the conversation. Data is a great passion for me, and thanks for giving me a platform to share my perspective to all of your audience. Thank you. Thank you so much to Redis for making this podcast possible. Thank you, Redis. <laughs>